That's the enemy. Uh, and uh, today we're going to try to uh, our best to sort of learn a little about them on their own terms. What the Persian Empire is, is a series of different uh, families that would dominate a vast region. Uh, and uh, what I give you here is uh, the largest extent that the Persian Empire would enjoy. Um, we 
which um, again really an area that would extend all the way from Egypt uh, to uh, uh, India, basically encompass uh, all of uh, the uh, ancient Near East uh, as part of the Syrian Empire, and really quite a lot more. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, the, this uh, empire, when it was at its height, was much larger than any of the empires we really talked about previously. Uh, and uh, this is going to create all sorts of new administrative headaches in size. It's not always necessarily a good thing. Um, and uh, really, it is in terms of the uh, the uh, amount of territory under its command, the, uh, uh, the more than 1,800 miles across, uh, every form of uh, landscape you could possibly think of, mountains, jungles, deserts, um, it was all here in the Persian Empire. Uh, and the, the population will go up to as many as 35 million. Uh, so for the Asian Empire, this is really just huge in size. Uh, and of course, as we'll see, um, uh, this is a, an empire too, uh, like many of you see, uh, that it projects power left and right. Uh, but it has to deal with, again, these sort of problems of bringing all these different peoples together as part of one empire. Uh, and uh, this is, I'm going to show you this one image in particular because um, this is one of the image from uh, one of the, uh, the palaces of the emperor, the Persian emperors. It shows people of different ethnicities uh, who Really, the only thing linking them in this image is that all of them are required to bring stuff to the emperor. Uh, that is what brings them together, the fact that they're required to give over a certain amount uh, of their money. But really, in fact, there's very little else. Uh, but uh, one of the things the Persian Empire is known for is bringing together people, uh, some of whom were live, living in it, others who just come for trade as well. So it becomes this sort of uh, this melting pot of peoples all together. Um, it is impossible to talk about the Persian Empire just uh, as listing facts about it. And uh, in fact, through its long history, it's going to undergo a lot of different changes. So the easiest way for us to discuss it is to break it down uh, into what we refer to as dynasties. Before, a uh, dynasty is simply a ruling house, a family, uh, and how they chose to run the empire. And as we'll see, there really are some distinctions uh, over the course of its history. All right, Start, starting with the first of these four dynasties, known as the Achaemenids. And uh, uh, the uh, person who launches this new imperial uh, venture uh, is this person here. As you can see, this is a rather fanciful image of him. Uh, he did not, in fact, have wings. Um, but uh, this is uh, the man known as Cyrus. Um, Cyrus himself comes from this mountainous region in what today is Iran. In fact, Iran uh, is the, really the, uh, the initial spot where the Persian Empire begins to grow. Uh, and uh, even today, uh, it's uh, pride sometimes in the accomplishments of the Persian Empire uh, in, in Iran. Um, the strange part about Cyrus is that uh, no one initially would have confused him uh, with being a, an emperor of a major empire. Uh, and uh, he really comes from this region in which, I mean, most people who lived in this area were shepherds. So we're talking about someone who did not initially come from a powerful area. Uh, and really, um, initially, we just think that he was a local tough guy, a warlord, uh, who would be, beat up on local people, force them to recognize him, and uh, he slowly begins to gain the following of all people who will do his will. Smartly enough, again, one of the reasons why Cyrus proves to be a very, a very good at what he does is he chooses to use those mountains that he's grown up in as a kind of fortress. For the very simple reason that trying to invade a fortress is suicidal. So he has a virtually impregnable base uh, to be able to do all these raids from. Uh, and uh, it actually turns out that he, um, in spite of not really having much training, he actually proves to, uh, proves to be someone who's tough, uh, who's creative, who has, he really has the fantastic military tactics. Uh, so um, he uh, very quickly begins to conquer all sorts of territory. Um, and uh, whenever he sees weakness in this local region, he takes out his, his, uh, his band of people who are following him, he begins to conquer areas in Iran slowly, uh, little by little. Uh, 
Uh, and, uh, and in fact, um, really it took them around five years to bring up essentially all of what today is Monday ran under his heel. Uh, and this is a, a slightly later image than Cyrus was this height, but this is just an image of uh, some of uh, the kind of warriors uh, that the uh, Persians had. Uh, the, the term that sometimes uh, will be used for the crack troops, the sort of uh, the core of uh, the, the armies of the Persian Empire, known as the immortals. Not because I should say that they live forever, uh, but because um, they really have always have other people supposedly waiting to take the position of the best troops if they die in battle. So it, it kind of as a body, it's a military body, they are immortal. They never lose any men, even though, of course, individuals uh, do die. You see them uh, with their spears here. Um, we see then, uh, and I won't go blow by blow, but it's fair to say that Cyrus in his lifetime uh, begins to form the core of uh, this new empire. Um, he uh, takes virtually all of Turkey. He attacks Mesopotamia. Again, yeah, still a rich area at his time. Uh, areas of what's today Afghanistan, Egypt. All of these things, uh, all these areas begin to fall at the feet of his army. And so, really, um, in a short period of time, Cyrus goes from around 20 years from being this really this small time guy who had, uh, had a really cool mountain fortress. Uh, so who really now is beginning to look a lot more like a king. He uh, has so much territory under his control. And, uh, and in fact, um, Cyrus is, um, he had such good control that even his successors, most of which were not as gifted as him, uh, could hold on to a lot of territory for a long time. But, so you talk about how he's such a fantastic military leader, but in the source that we read yesterday, that was about King Cyrus, correct? Uh, okay. No, not for um, you're thinking about um, the, the ones for Alexander the Great, or no? no the one that we read for today. Is um, that Persian? I think I just had images for today. No. 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 There's There's I'll check my own syllabus now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me review. I, I, I honestly um, I wrote the syllabus so long ago. I don't remember the exact syllabus. Uh, it was about. I don't remember the title. Yeah, yeah. It was about how like he would go into like the specific area and he would. Want to befriend them and then like repair, um, like the labor and different buildings that were dilapidated. And it just seems like he came across as like, oh, I want to befriend you and I want to make peace with you, rather than being like, oh, oh no, 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 no. World War. Uh, this is a I didn't know the source you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, this really really speaks to the fact that how clever he was in a certain sense, right? I mean, if you can befriend people to death, uh, then it's much easier than having to to kill them. Uh, I mean, I, I, there, I, I'm glossing over this because I think that really the fact that he had military muscle is the reason he was able to take these regions. But uh, that's not to say that I don't think he was smart and knew what he was doing. But, uh, I don't think that vision necessarily um, contradicts the fact he's also very good militarily. But you don't have to, uh, you know, fight people. You can make them think you're friendly. He was still taking taxes from those regions that he found. In case you want to see where Cyrus's uh, final resting place uh, used to be, um, this is uh, his tomb. Very, uh, very uh, ornamented, by the way, for someone who gained as much as in his lifetime. Uh, the one thing that is not in his tomb is goods or um, his body. Uh, they're all gone. It's an empty tomb uh, right now. Uh, and what tomb robber wanted a body uh, is something I don't quite understand myself. But in any case, they made up with everything that was not nailed. We don't have a lot of time here to talk about every single person in this first dynasty, but one other very important emperor who followed after Cyrus is known as Darius. For those who play the one at home, this is not the same Darius who uh, uh, ends up losing battle after battle with Alexander. Uh, this is Darius the first, uh, third ruler against Alexander, who follows as a um, In a certain sense, uh, we think that uh, Darius was more of the same. I mean, uh, first and foremost, Persian emperors have to be strong. Uh, and so, in, in that respect, he holds on and he expands territory. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, new things that he ends up doing. Um, one of them, uh, actually, we have uh, uh, a very good idea of the kind of military uh, operation that Darius undertakes because he tells us about it. He creates this fantastic piece of um, propaganda, this inscription. 
uh, that um, is, is, on, is carved into the side of a mountain in Iran. Uh, so this, to this day, um, Icarus is, um, Icarus, uh, is inscription is up. Uh, and uh, if, if you look very closely, you'll see all the different peoples who we uh, supposedly conquer, including the elves, um, are all uh, conquered. And you'll notice that uh, uh, they're all chained up um, in a row behind it. What's very interesting though, reading this inscription, the inscription is very similar to one you've read in the past, and I've killed these people, I took these people, I took the twins. Um, what's interesting about it is that um, he actually brags about taking territory that was already taken, that theoretically the Persians already owned, uh, which makes us think that at times he's bragging about not really taking new territory, bringing new territory in, but putting down the valleys. Uh, and this actually points to one of the other recurrent features of, of Persian government, which is that it's one thing to take a territory, uh, it's another thing to hold it. And uh, the rebellions were very general things, and they had to constantly go back and knock enough heads uh, to be able to uh, hold on to the areas. The other uh, reason we talk a lot about uh, Darius in particular uh, is that we thought he really thinks a lot more about administration than previous emperors. And so specifically at the, uh, the city that we usually refer to, um, that here, Persepolis, uh, which is the uh, which becomes the capital city of the empire in its first stage. And uh, um, even today, if you were to go to Iran and see, uh, not that they're allowed to uh, diplomatically, but um, if you were, you would see that uh, the, some of these vast halls, uh, some of the uh, remains are still there. I uh, can see uh, the kind of things. So in some cases, by the way, this stuff was rebuilt and put back up again. So. Um, it doesn't exactly look like it did in the ancient world. I've seen the gates of uh, Persepolis. And, uh, at least from a uh, description of the time, this was a vast sort of, uh, sort of interlocking area of uh, various um, uh, rooms for administration, for um, the, uh, the king's quarters, the treasury. Uh, Persepolis was supposed to be enormous, and it really was the nerve center of this empire. It really beat that part beat. Uh, and uh, again, just as we see with other emperors, uh, the propaganda goes up. Kings begin to refer to themselves as inscriptions, as being uh, eternally like the king of kings, which means like the highest king uh, possible. We also think uh, that, um, although again, this was the official propaganda, there were really uh, this whole sort of interlocking mess of bureaucrats that were going to be the king who served him and allowed him to be able to do his work. Uh, and in particular, the one that you really should know more than anyone else uh, are these people known as satraps. Uh, and satrap is a Persian term that simply means governor. Uh, these are people who were the representatives of the Persians, um, and uh, they would um, they would uh, they would be usually Persian by ethnicity. They would go out to different places in the empire, and there'd be constant communication with. The emperor. Um, and uh, they, they would by the take all sorts of local people to help them with the government, but the highest of people had to be Persian uh, normally. What I like about um, this form of uh, really having governors is nothing unusual in an empire. Um, what I like about them is that um, there, there's a systematic um, disbelief that, that they're going to prove to be trustworthy. And in fact, on a regular basis, uh, the Persian emperor would send out spies of his own men just to make sure uh, that they were really ruling in his name, doing what he asked, uh, with the, uh, the attitude, in fact, that if they, if they weren't, then they would be removed very quickly. Um, especially if anyone who was thinking about staging a rebellion against him. Uh, so there's, there's paranoia almost in the system. We also think uh, that although again they're harder to see, uh, there's, a, there's just a coin up by the Persian emperor. Um, there's this huge number of different professionals who serve the Persian. Uh, they have uh, people who collect taxes, uh, people who collect records, um, translators. Translation is a big deal. But there are people of all different ethnicities, so you need to be able to translate. <laughs> to tell them where to deliver their money, uh, essentially, uh, but other things as well. Uh, and um, having a government of this size, again, the, the problem is rebellion. The good part about it is that now they have one currency ruled in this vast territory. 
uh, they have standard laws, uh, they have taxes on a regular basis. Uh, and using those taxes, then you could do things like build roads. They had fantastic roads that snaked across this entire territory. Um, they had, and they even had a mail service, a courier service. You can get mail from one place to the next. Uh, they made huge work, huge public work projects, canals, uh, iron tools, gold. Uh, we don't have a lot of their gold left, but we do occasionally have some of these luxury items um, that suggest to us that, that they uh, were very skilled in terms of the working with metal, and they like shiny things like old people we've seen so far. Um, or Um, we do think, though, that, again, the part of the, the reason that this first dynasty begins to run into problems, even with gifted rulers like Cyrus and Darius, uh, has to do with how they treat people, uh, ethnic minorities within this kingdom. Um, the first uh, major emperor, again, we talked about Cyrus, uh, it was very clear to him that he was going to pursue a policy of tolerance when it came to difference. Uh, in fact, he really appeared to have a lot of respect for individual cultural traditions of the empire. And we know that, in fact, this is actually one of the most famous uh, documents to come out of Cyrus's reign. It's basically the size of a football, um, and it's much referred to as a Cyrus cylinder. And in it, he actually proclaims that uh, uh, this policy of toleration for, for people who are different. Um, and uh, in fact, that actually extended to our religion as well. And in fact, some of you may know that, although this is very weird, um, the Bible actually likes Cyrus a lot, although he was probably not someone who generally, uh, the authors of the Bible would have gotten along with well. Uh, but Cyrus respected Judaism as other religions, and in fact, even gives uh, Jews who previously had been exiled money to go back and build their temple again. Uh, so Cyrus is seen as very positive uh, in terms of the Bible. All this, you may think this sounds great, uh, but later, later uh, emperors uh, within the Persian Empire really begin to get rid of this policy that Cyrus had, and begin to shift to a policy of greater intolerance towards cultural difference within their empire. Uh, the, the attitude began to become that, well, you know what the reason we're having these rebellions? People are not Persian enough. Uh, and so they begin to try to stamp out uh, this sort of differences in culture and religion. And uh, in fact, it has the uh, result of making people even less happy with them. So um, there's no way to win uh, in that game. The other problem that the First Dynasty runs into is one that we've talked about in this class already, which is to say uh, the war with the Greeks. Uh, and uh, uh, again, um, we've talked about this as one of the great successes of, of ancient Greece, that they fended off the Persians. But from the Persian point of view, the wars against the Greeks were an unmitigated disaster. They had poured so much money and material into these battles, and they essentially got nothing out of it. Um, and uh, in effect, uh, we do think that um, this actually further, uh, it further ups the unpopularity of this first dynasty. If you're going to have to go with these wars, you have to conquer stuff. Uh, and if you don't do it, uh, people are going to get upset very quickly. Uh, and uh, eventually, in fact, uh, this doesn't mean the Greeks uh, will be in any position immediately to take the Persian Empire. They're still too small and disunited. Uh, but it does mean now uh, that these rebellions that had always been a problem for the first time begin to become very general. And they really sap all the strength uh, from this empire. But when one dynasty falls, another one rises. And now we'll turn to the second of these two major dynasties under the Persians, known as the Seleucids. I'm not going to talk much about the fall of the first dynasty because we, you've read about it now a lot. In fact, if if a really a, um, if it was already a rotten door, this first dynasty, the person who kicks it open and makes the entire house collapse uh, is Alexander the Great, um, and uh, he really basically, you know, by war of course, ends up destroying the first dynasty for good. Uh, and uh, while he's doing it, of course, uh, it's already read. Uh, one of his most infamous actions, he will actually march to the capital city of the Persians, Persepolis, and set it on fire. Uh, which at the time seemed like, wow, this is really cool. Um, afterwards, those satyr heads began to wonder, like, 
we could have actually used this as sort of a, a capital. I, I don't understand why we burnt this. This was perfectly good. Um, so it was really kind of a foolish move in retrospect. But it does show you just how, in some sense, rash Alexander was. He didn't care about those efforts. You know. um, Alexander initially, it appears, as we said, he really did like Persian ways. He wanted to portray himself as the successor to the legitimate emperor of the First Dynasty. But he didn't have much time to do that. And in fact, it was one of um, Alexander's men, uh, the founder of this new dynasty. It was named, uh, you probably don't need to know, it's a, uh, actually, yeah, I think it's a, oh yes, you do know, you do know, uh, Seleucus. Um, this was uh, Alexander, one of these very talented generals um, who was fighting with Alexander, who, like many of his great generals, at Alexander's death, he tried to snatch up a piece of what had previously been the United Empire. Uh, and um, really, in some sense, uh, Seleucus, the founder of the Second Dynasty, um, recognizes he doesn't have time to reinvent the wheel upon coming into this new empire and trying to take the Persian Empire. And so we really think, for the most part, he goes ahead and he tries to perpetuate exactly everything that had existed before the way of ruler. Same administration the same taxes, the same roads, the same satraps. Uh, in essence, they really duplicate the exact same government machinery because he, he doesn't really have any way to rule other places. He doesn't know how to do. If there's anything that the uh, this new dynasty decides that they really need more of in the Persian Empire, it is Greeks. Uh, and um, the Seleucid dynasty begins to, as other places in Alexander's empire, they begin to build up these new Greek cities and invite Greek colonists to come and live among them and to trade with them, uh, which they feel will help to make this more of a Greek place. And if there was one good idea the Second Dynasty had, it was that, that actually this does uh, fulfill their dreams of uh, helping to bolster the economy. We do think, though, that the um, um, reason we will not spend much time talking about this Second Dynasty is that it really does not last that long. Uh, and in part of that, we think that um, many of the people, the natives who lived in this region said, with some justification, these people are a bunch of farmers. And in fact, they were right. I mean, these are people who had come from the Greek world to take this area and held on to their Greek uh, identity. Uh, and so um, at least, at least uh, the First Dynasty had one natural place that would be to it. Uh, this, this new dynasty had absolutely no one who was rooting for them to succeed. They hate or hated. Uh, and in fact, the exact same problems that the first dynasty had begin to uh, uh, creep up again. All these ethnic minorities hated being part of the Persian Empire. They rebelled again and again. And in fact, what we really see is that the size of territory under this, uh, the, this second dynasty begins to shrink and shrink as time goes on. They can't hold all this territory together. All right, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, when the dynasty falls, yet another rises. Uh, and this is the third of the dynasties within the Persian Empire known as the Parthians. We think that the Seleucids, uh, in time, they're really um, on the defensive in terms of battle. Uh, and uh, this really left a wide open opportunity then for a new dynasty to come. Uh, and to destroy them, uh, and uh, especially they were so sapped by rebellion. And that's where the Parthians come into, uh, into account. And you see here, this is actually this home carving of um, this sort of the typical war warrior among the Parthians. Parthians were known to be the people who were uh, a nomadic group previously, wandered around, especially modern day Iran. They were known for their fantastic ability to ride horses uh, and shoot arrows at the same time, as you see here. Their, some of their battle strategies are revolved around that. Um, we think that um, the Parthians, sensing that there was blood in the water, essentially, uh, begin now to, to come together and begin to seriously uh, to, to knock out the selling uses from competition. And then they turn around and begin a conquest in their own name, uh, that they are going to be the new rulers. Uh, interestingly enough, by the way, one of the first regions they strike outside of Iran is Mesopotamia. Again, this is really a rich territory. You have to get that as part of your empire. There's more uh, Parthians. 
The weird part about studying the Parthians is that they actually do now. They're going to be now empire rulers. They're going to rule over this vast territory. But one sense is that their heart was never really in it. Um, in some sense, again, when you're when you're used to talking about an, an empire, you're used to having a very strong central figure, an emperor who has that rules with an iron fist. The Parthians, they started as a nomadic group with a bunch of basically tribal leaders who would come together, and then they would say, okay, what should we conquer next? You know, let's get all our people on board. Um, so much more of a, a government that was spread out, not one that was concentrated in one person, uh, which makes sense if you're a nomadic group. It makes a whole lot less sense when all of a sudden now you are uh, actually staring at this huge empire you're trying to decide how to run it correctly. Uh, and so, but you still, they, they really do keep this idea that we are a federation of different peoples, uh, and uh, that's how they rule the government, too. Which I don't need to tell you meant that a lot of their uh, decision making was very creaky, to say the least, because they had to collect all these different, uh, different people and get them to agree to do anything. Now, you may, uh, one of the big problems uh, that many nomadic peoples suffer when they turn to uh, doing settled agriculture and moving more territories is they go soft. Um, they're not as strong as they used to be and they uh, fought constantly. Uh, the part of this too, though, uh, really subvert expectations here. Uh, and in fact, not all, uh, because they never get their hands really dirty with all the business of government, they still have plenty of time at their disposal to train and fight. And in fact, they have um, much, much better horses than they ever did before, much better armor. Part of the good thing about horses, um, I really only learned this this course, is that um, if you feed them alpha, alpha during the winter, um, then they will remain stronger. Well, nomadic groups frequently suffer from the problem um, that your horses will grow weak during the winter because they're not being fed as much. Uh, but now the Parthians have plenty of money. So they can continue to feed their horses, they stayed strong, and now they had much better armor because they could afford it. So in fact, um, far from going small, they actually were just as terrible as ever. In fact, even worse against their enemies uh, than they'd ever been when they had now an empire bankroll of these people. Um, we think that, um, so uh, again, a good portion of the Parthian then is focused on war. Um, and interestingly enough, and, and this is really going to sound like I'm just repeating myself, but I'm, I'm doing it with the new dynasty. Um, we do think that the Parthians, their attitude becomes that, well, listen, our job is to fight. And we can get other people to run the government for us because we can pay them. And so really, uh, in a very weird way, um, they keep up the exact same government structures that it held during the first and the second dynasties. Uh, it's really just a replica. Uh, they have governors called satraps that they send out. They run the same way. Um, they tax the same exact way. Um, all of these things. And they even decide, um, this is actually a, um, I, I told you already before that the, one of the old dynasties did have a capital city known as Persepolis, and that had already been destroyed. But um, even though these people were at heart nomadic warriors, they decided because the previous dynasty had a capital city, we ought to have one too. Uh, they found it in the same way. Uh, the, the only difference now is where they choose. They choose to refound a new city uh, known as Testify. You don't actually hear that city. If you look close, you'll notice it's right near Mesopotamia. That is one of their, their, their power over these bridges. Um, and if, there's only a small piece of festival left over today. You can see the huge, this absolutely enormous gate that used to dominate. Um, not much more other than that. Although they are nomadic peoples, uh, we still have all sorts of goodies uh, that they stole. Uh, during uh, their time uh, in office. And this is just ahead. Um, the weird part about the Parthians is even as this government keeps grinding along, uh, we don't think, uh, in time, the kind of weakness of their government begins to expose itself. And when they actually face the same exact rebellion that previous dynasties have faced, uh, they're terrible sometimes at dealing with them because they have to get everyone together to make decisions about what, how they're going to fight. Which meant that sometimes rebellions just raged on for far too long before they were put down. Um, we also think that another of the problems that the Parthians run into as a dynasty uh, is that they are in constant warfare with Rome. 
Um, this is, uh, we'll talk more about Rome later in the semester, but um, this is, they actually do very well against the Romans, far better than a lot of other foreign armies. They hold them themselves. Uh, but it did mean at times uh, that they uh, lost a lot of men and had to divert resources. And in fact, at one point, Romans actually managed to take the capital city Testify uh, and destroy portions of it. So it can be destructive to be in the war, even if generally they did fine against Romans. All right, the fourth and the final of these dynasties that I'll talk about in the Persian Empire is known as the Sassanids. Um, in, in times, kind of, um, you know, this inherent weakness that, that we talked about with the Parthians, this, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, their government in some sense really being run very poorly from the top, um, and uh, the, uh, the constant recurrence of rebellions would finally give an opening for this final family uh, to come in and to sweep into power. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, again, uh, they build up a bit of military might to basically push the Parthians out of existence, uh, and they uh, again choose to rule over the empire. Um, if there is a real um, innovation of the Parthians. And part of the reason I can show you some of this cool stuff like this, um, I would like this, I don't play. Um, the king was out hunting. Uh, this was not a play that was even off of it, it's just too pretty. Uh, but you can see again, the kings are out. Uh, um, a beautiful summer day. Of course, um, still a little tacky. Uh, in any case, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of metal went into this thing. Um, as you're getting the sense of from all of this, this is the kind of stuff that they really like. Um, this last one I said they love finery, they love ornamentation, embellishment. They wanted, they felt that one of the things you had to do if you were an emperor uh, was you showed off your wealth. And they felt that the last dynasty had done a bad job of that because they didn't even really care about wealth as much or even showing it off in the way that they did. In many ways, um, and uh, uh, one of the parts of this sort of um, um, building up again was the, uh, the capital city of Testify, uh, which had been really wrecked as a result of these wars with Romans. Um, the uh, the Sassanids will pour money into that to make this a showcase city. Uh, again. Um, in, in some ways, though, um, and again, you're going to get tired of me saying this, um, we do think that much of the government structure under this last line of Sassanids was very similar. Um, even their propaganda sounds like they basically borrowed it from the first dynasty. They, for instance, referred themselves to the exact same title, the King of Kings, as if nothing had changed in the centuries uh, between them. The administration uh, is exactly uh, the same uh, as it had been before. There's still satraps, the same taxes, the same roads. Um, the Persians do not have many new ideas when it comes to government. They just take the same things out of the closet, dust them off, and they put them out again. Um, if there's anything that's slightly new under the Sassanids, in addition to just like going back to the past, is that their ideology, um, they actually uh, they create enough peace uh, that uh, the Persian Empire becomes even more of a trading zone while they're in, uh, in, uh, in charge of the, the area. Uh, and in fact, part of this trading is introducing new crops into the empire, like for instance, uh, rice, uh, sugar cane, uh, certain citrus fruits, cotton. All of these things are beginning to get cultivated in the empire in large numbers in some cases. Oh, here's another uh, piece of it. Sure. If there is uh, one emperor in this last dynasty whom I really want you to know, uh, this is the man uh, known as Shapur the uh, first. And uh, you'll, you'll notice something here. This, this is another one of these ridiculous Persian monuments that's carved to the side of Old Palma Mountain. Uh, and you'll notice if you look closely here, um, these are actually two different Roman emperors. Uh, who he has, they've chosen to depict in this humiliating position. So they're, they're taking care of his horse for him, basically. Uh, it's what they're doing. They're stable boys. Um, and which gives you some idea of what he thought of Roman emperors. Um, Shakur I uh, was, like some of the other previous emperors, um, he really was very frequently at war with Romans. Again, these are his western neighbors now. 
Uh, and so uh, they're constantly battling against them, uh, which is part of the reason they have this propaganda against them. Uh, but it affects Shapur the first with a gifted warrior, we think. He does very well against the Romans. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, at a time in which the Roman armies were fairly weak, uh, Shapur the first actually, at one point, will manage to capture a Roman emperor alive on the battlefield. Not exactly as it's depicted here, uh, but, but that's what this is, this um, this cameo basically was, was created to commemorate this famous event where he takes a, a Roman uh, a Roman emperor alive and takes it back to Persia with him. Okay, so you will be curious. This is Onyx, uh, the this car. In spite of this, again, um, again, a lot of uh, his relationships then with Romans were through war. But Shapur the first was smart enough to recognize that Romans were actually very good at doing a lot of stuff, uh, and he could take advantage of Romans in other ways. Uh, so, for instance, um, in some cases, he actually takes prisoners in battle against Rome, and he will invite these people to come live in his reign. And in fact, even he invites people who have technical skills, like for instance. Uh, Romans were known for their engineering skills, their ability to build roads and dams. And rather than just kill Romans, he actually has those kind of people come in and build those sort of things in the empire as well. So it was small. Um, ultimately, no Persian emperor uh, after Shapur ever has the same level of skill he has. And uh, we think, weirdly enough, the Persian Empire begins to uh, again weaken. Uh, this time, uh, in part because um, they are an empire that really depends a lot upon constant military expansion and conquest. And in the West, they couldn't actually make much headway against the Romans in the, in the long, uh, long run. Uh, and in the east of their empire, they could never really expand much against the various uh, powers in India, which meant that um, there was nowhere for them to expand. Uh, for an empire that depended upon this kind of expansion and conquest, it was no longer there anymore. And so uh, they get internally sapped of a lot of energy, which saps this dynasty of a lot of its, its military force. And uh, finally, what really wipes the Persian Empire off the map, the reason we don't talk about it anymore, uh, is in the first wave of Muslim conquest, uh, the Muslim armies are going to uh, take the Persian Empire first, sensing its weakness. And that would be the end of the Persian Empire entirely. And we'll talk more about the Muslim conquests later on, but uh, one of the first victims of the Persians. All right, there's one thing that I've left entirely out of this discussion up until now, not because it wasn't important, but because I couldn't really fit it anywhere, and that is the major imperial religion uh, of the uh, Persian Empire, which is known as Zoroastrianism. Uh, and, uh, this is a religion uh, that most people tend to think is extremely influential over some of the major uh, monotheistic traditions that uh, you know and love, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, but uh, itself, um, people tend not to talk much about this religion these days. And there's still those people adherence to it to this day, but uh, they're really a small number. The founder of this new religion uh, is this man here, known as Zoroaster. I'm just saying, wow, that's a fantastic image of Zoroaster. Uh, but in fact, it's not actually uh, what Zoroaster really looked like. Um, this is a Renaissance painting of Zoroaster. We have no idea of what he looked like. Uh, we have no reliable images. And, and in fact, um, most people tend to think Zoroaster was a real living human being. But we also have to admit that what we know about his career is really uh, very little. In fact, if you look at the, the, uh, the outline I have, we don't even have exact dates for Zoroaster. For someone who's a founder of a major religion, um, we really don't know exactly how we um, So far as we can piece together from various uh, sources internal to the religion, we tend to think that Zoroaster is someone who's a Persian. He grew up within the empire, in the heartland of it, probably. Um, he seems to have come from a very well-placed family, an aristocratic family. And uh, he may actually have been uh, a priest, of uh, some kind of priest from an older religion that had existed in the Persian Empire. Uh, but for whatever reason, and it's not entirely clear, he seems to have been dissatisfied with whatever his previous religion was. And right around when he is 20 years old, as the story goes, 
Zoroastrus will leave home uh, in a search for wisdom. Again, this is a story we've heard before, of course, but um, it definitely happened with Zoroaster as well. Uh, and uh, Zoroaster apparently wanders uh, for around 10 years trying to find new religious wisdom. When all of a sudden, then, um, uh, you know, he, he actually is supposedly struck by this series of revelations uh, that will completely turn his life around. Right? Give him now um, a, a different role in society than he had previously. Um, we, these visions, uh, so far as we know from again uh, people who are believers, uh, was that um, he said they supposedly come from this new god who previously had not been worshipped, a uh, god known as Hora Mazda, um, a term that means the wise lord. And uh, the reason why he was receiving these visions uh, is that Ahura Mazda had chosen him, Zoroaster, uh, to be his prophet. And now it was up to him to spread uh, the, uh, the faith. And that's why, again, we often use the term Zoroastrianism to describe this religion, um, because uh, he's really the, the person who's at the heart of this new religion. Um, he's not worshipped, but someone who uh, was one who propagated, who spread his faith. You know, start to make his popular as he came. What you want me to tell you at this point was, okay, well, what exactly was this new teaching? What was this new religion? Uh, and uh, you'll also be extremely unhappy to learn uh, that we really only have the vaguest sense about, especially some of the early stages of Zoroastrianism and how it's founded as a religion. Uh, and in fact, um, we do not have all that much when it comes to source material. It's actually very frustrating for those people who want to go back to the origins of Zoroastrianism. We simply don't have that level of source material uh, that will allow us to speak very intelligently about it. Uh, and uh, part, there's actually several different reasons of why our source material is so bad. Uh, part of it is that we think that um, the, uh, the way that the knowledge was transmitted in Zoroastrianism was always oral in the beginning. They didn't really feel the need to write things down. There was no uh, really compelling purpose initially. Um, and uh, in fact, um, and we know um, uh, we know that it was a religion um, that really uh, had a lot of hymns, for instance. Um, you know, a lot of its um, teachings, a lot of its doctrine was passed down through different hymns. But again, entirely in a sort of song oral tradition. Uh, they didn't feel the need to write these things down. Um, and uh, the keepers of this tradition, uh, keepers of, of this oral tradition, uh, was uh, a group known as the Magi, uh, who were the, the priests of Zoroastrianism. If you have heard of the Magi, and probably most of you have, it is because they make a cameo appearance in the New Testament, when of course the Magi will come to, uh, to venerate Jesus. Uh, and the point of this story, and people at the time would have known it, is that you know, the, uh, the knowledge of Jesus had gone far outside the bounds of the Roman Empire. Even these foreign priests were now coming uh, to venerate Jesus. There's a reason why uh, Magi appeared there. Um, but Magi themselves are the major priestly class in the Persian Empire. And really, they're very powerful uh, in many ways, they're, and they're also uh, again, the keepers of this secret knowledge uh, for generations. Um, the other um, reason why our source material is so bad uh, for Zoroastrians is because um, when Muslims come and conquer this territory, they do not look very fondly on Zoroastrianism. And in fact, they actually, uh, many Muslims will later systematically go ahead and destroy Zoroastrian documents and monuments because uh, they think it's a polytheistic religion, they think it's an idolatrous religion. Uh, and that actually has also uh, helped to obscure the origins and the early uh, history of this faith. All right. From later documents, though, uh, we can talk a little bit about what this religion is all about. Uh, and first of all, uh, it is fair to say uh, that it is not a religion uh, that is a monotheistic religion. Um, Ahura Mazda is their greatest god by far. But he's actually surrounded by all sorts of lesser gods. 
The way that Neuroastrogen is described is a horomazda is constantly at battle uh, with the forces of evil, and especially um, this sort of main adversary, which to us looks like a Satan figure, um, this evil spirit. He constantly is lost in battle. So good versus evil, light versus dark, uh, white versus black. Ultimately, though, Zoroastrians had faith that everything would turn out for the best. And it was believed that a Hermaster, after this long battle, you know, uh, uh, with the force of evil, would finally manage to uh, conquer evil completely. Uh, and um, uh, at this point, then, um, uh, people then would either um, be rewarded with heaven or hell. This is the end time, or the, final, the, end, the final battle against evil. Uh, have been won. Uh, and then, in fact, the human beings, based upon how holy their words were, their deeds were, they can either uh, they go to heaven or go to hell. And, uh, by the way, all of uh, again, a lot of this imagery, especially that um, the Zoroastrians would use to describe heaven and hell, including uh, the existence of angels and demons, sometimes that imagery was borrowed very, very closely by, by both Jews and Christians and even Muslims later on. Uh, so a lot of their ideas will live on if some of those other beliefs, like polytheism, do not. Uh, ultimately, Ahura Mazda is described in the sources as being a good god. He doesn't want people to forsake the world. He wants to enjoy its fruits. Um, and uh, in effect, um, it's one of the, the, the jobs you can have in your life is to do those sort of things. You take, uh, take advantage of what's in the world. Altogether, we think uh, Zoroastrianism um, although I, I realize that today it has become enormously unpopular, or uh, it really, uh, for a certain period of time in the Persian Empire site, this was by far the majority of religion among millions of people. Uh, and we know that not only was it a popular religion, but it meant that the Magi enjoyed this enormous uh, power within the empire. Um, first of all, because they were the ones who carried out rituals, they sung its hymns, um, they taught people how to live good lives in correspondence with uh, what Karamazov wanted, and then that would allow them in time eventually uh, to hopefully gain heaven. Uh, but we also think uh, that uh, the Magi often were advisors to emperors. Uh, some of these important Magi actually helped direct the course of action uh, of emperors. Um, one of the ways we can um, get some sense of the power both that the Magi had and generally that this religion has is to see that in a lot of the propaganda that uh, Persian emperors have, they actually attribute a lot of their success to a Pearl Master. Uh, it comes up again and again. And so I'll actually take you back from this is the image that we saw earlier. But if you look closely here, uh, you may wonder what this uh, sort of uh, uh, thing floating here. It actually is meant to be an image of Haramazda here. And you can see he's kind of, he's meant to be sort of like blessing uh, the Persian emperor uh, here. So in fact, uh, it, there was this sense in many of uh, the monuments that the Persian emperors wanted to very closely ally himself with Haramazda. If you did good to him, uh, then he would in turn reward you with his military victory as well as anything else. Here's another example I showed you earlier, but just uh, what this is is it almost looks like it could be a fist pound, but uh, in fact, a Haramazd is meant to be sort of conferring power uh, upon uh, one of the Persian emperors. So they're really, uh, in some sense, uh, Zoroastrianism also becomes a very political religion. It's a religion that all the emperors are constantly uh, praying to. Uh, it's uh, the religion of the, they have the sort of priests who help guide them as well. Please. Um, which empire does this start? Because I know when we, in the source too, when I was talking about um, how Cyrus attributed Marduk yeah. with a bunch of his power, like when did this start to come back? Uh, it, it's, it's within in the first dynasty. It's not immediately at the beginning, but um, it, it sort of begins to catch fire before the end of the first dynasty. But after that, it's always the it comes to the Right, it's not eternal. And in fact, you can see uh, Cyrus is the most of the old uh, Near Eastern God. Well, finally, the Russian pushes that out of that shit. Good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, are there any final questions about the winter? If not, take it. Take it. Go quickly, please. So, is it honor, honor, and respect? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, trust me when I tell you.
tell you about uh, again, um, it's really much more obvious in your custom page of websites than you think it is. So, um, yes, eligibility is on your honor, but um, I can suss it out. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I'd rather have all of you just you know, be honest and not force me to search, like, search the website or figure out where you're off the site. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I trust you. All right. I will see, uh, see you next week. Remember, Friday, thank you for some more Thank you.